From Advisory Board, we are bringing you a radio advisory. My name is Rachel Woods. You can call me Ray. Today, I want to talk about a subject that might seem a little bit dull, and that's supply chain. But while the world of supply chain has long been largely operational, COVID-19 has forced a much more strategic conversation about providers' approach to supply chain. To have that conversation, I've brought my colleague, Brandy Greenberg. Hey, Brandy. Hi, Ray. How you doing today? I'm doing really well. They just opened the beaches in California a couple days ago, so I can walk on the sand again. Oh, I, I, am, I am deeply jealous of that, especially when it's going to be in the 80s here in, in D.C. this weekend. Yeah, it, I must admit, it is very nice to have the ocean open again. I'm excited to have this conversation with you because I know this is something that you have been living and breathing for a while. Absolutely. I'd say for the past 15 years, my team and I have been looking at how health systems distributors and suppliers can work more effectively together. So, Brandy, to start, I actually want you to ground us in describing what are all the components of supply chain? What is it that we're actually talking about here? When we think about a supply chain, we really need to think about it as a chain, as interconnected links. In this case of the healthcare supply chain, you're talking about going front to back purchasers, so hospitals, health systems, physician groups, everybody who needs that protective equipment or those ventilators or those beds. Very often, they are buying from distributors as well as manufacturers, and distributors will aggregate, bring the inventory together, bring it to the purchaser. Those distributors are pooling from thousands of different manufacturers, each of whom have manufacturing sites uh, in many places, and those manufacturing sites are all pulling from lots of different suppliers themselves providing raw materials and component parts. So you have a deeply global and interconnected healthcare supply chain. Which is, I think, why in the kind of height of the pandemic, it was really difficult to shore up enough PPE, enough supplies, because it's not something that you can just ask people to make more of. Is that right? Absolutely. And in the case of PPE, one thing I will note is that the regulatory issue surfaced as one that maybe not a lot of people understood. A lot of the folks that were manufacturing, say, N95 masks for non-medical purposes, those masks were being made on what's considered to be non-medical grade manufacturing lines. And until CDC changed their guidelines and approved these, they couldn't necessarily just take the same materials coming off those lines and send them to healthcare. And so we had to go through the distinction between medical grade and non-medical grade as one step that even beyond what is typical in the supply chain in order to even increase supply. What else made this really hard? So there were two fundamental things we learned about the healthcare supply chain uh, at the peak of the, the COVID crisis. The first was we really saw that this was a supply chain designed for maximum efficiency. Every participant and every stage of the process was about getting uh, lowest cost items through the, through the chain. That affected where they were produced, how they were produced, uh, and how they were distributed. Efficient supply chains are not necessarily flexible. And so when we found out that we needed two, three, four times as much equipment as before, that takes a long time to build that flexibility into the system. The second thing we learned was that there wasn't enough transparency into the supply chain for potential suppliers to meet other manufacturers or to meet other providers And so we really couldn't do the matchmaking and allocation that needed to happen to get the right products to the right providers. And I'm assuming because our current supply chain is so focused on efficiency, right, it's not flexible, it's not necessarily transparent. That's why we sort of had to see a lot of the innovations that came out of supply chain across the last eight weeks. Can you share some of your favorites? Absolutely. And My team and I have actually considered several of these innovations to be the highlights of our week. The first is really simple when you think about component parts and what does it take to make something like a face shield? Turns out you can actually make 
a NIH recommended face shield by 3D printing the holder and using transparencies that your teacher used to use in middle school as the shield. Hmm. And University of Washington had pioneered that and partnered with some local craftsmen to be able to make thousands of, again, NIH recommended face shields simply with 3D printing and office supplies. Hmm. What are some of your other, I, I think you actually coined the term MacGyvering. Are there, a, are there a couple other MacGyvered solutions that you were really happy about? I definitely can't take credit for coining the term. I think it probably reflects more my age than anything else that I grew up with the TV show MacGyver. And I am married to uh, a husband who prides himself on being able to fix things using whatever parts he has available. But that is absolutely what our hospitals and health systems and physician groups have done over the last two months. Beyond just the stuff that gets a lot of press, where you've got fashion makers using otherwise furloughed seamstresses to make masks and things like that, you actually had several organizations figure out pretty quickly that they could do sterile reprocessing on masks. And there's an organization, Battelle, that's gotten quite a bit of publicity by partnering with uh, Ohio Health and some others to figure out how to use their sterile reprocessing on N95 masks to really increase the use of anywhere from two to 20 times depending on, I guess, how much wear and tear. Mm -hmm. And do you know why that's actually one of my favorite stories? Are you from Ohio? I am from Ohio. I have, Patel is a Columbus, Ohio company. Take me into right now. So eight plus weeks into dealing with the pandemic, do health systems largely now have the supplies they need? I don't know that I'd go so far as to say they have the supplies that they need but I think that they have many more tools in their toolkit to procure them than they did four to eight weeks ago. And they are now trying to move into that next phase of, we probably have enough for now. How do we start to build up our stockpiles? How do we start to anticipate if those next waves, those next surges coming? And that's where I think some of the exchange platforms that we're seeing develop are really that next wave of innovation that's trying to solve for transparency. Hmm, interesting. Tell me, what, what does an exchange platform for supply chain look like? So you can either have the high-tech version, which is what IBM is offering uh, using blockchain technology that admittedly I don't fully understand, uh, to launch something that they call Rapid Supplier Connect, where essentially they are doing the work of vetting all of these hundreds of new PPE suppliers that have come online offering to make everything from masks and gloves and booties, they're doing the vetting, making the supplier is legitimate, produces high quality stuff, and putting them on a network that brings them together. And they can announce how much inventory they have, how long it would take to get to the provider, and do the matchmaking, essentially. The much more fun example in my mind is what we were calling almost online swap meets essentially going back to the days of brokering and trading my baseball card for your school lunch. There was an example of uh, uh, one health system had more than enough face masks. Another one had ample hand sanitizer due to some local distilleries, and they were able to find each other and make a trade. We'll be right back with more radio advisory after this short break. Hi. I'm Chris with the Radio Advisory Team. On behalf of everyone at Advisory Board, thank you for everything you're doing to battle COVID-19. We want to help you celebrate the bright spots. Perhaps you've been amazed at how your teams, your peers, or your leaders are supporting you. Or perhaps a patient's words reminded you of why you do what you do. What bright spots are you seeing? We want to hear from you. Share your story at advisory.com slash thank you and view our message of thanks. In an honest moment, I think some of these exchanges are continued innovations that highlight exactly the two challenges you started off with. The supply chain of today isn't necessarily flexible enough nor transparent enough. I'm curious... Looking forward, what are some of the big lessons that we've learned about the state of our supply chain because of COVID? Great question. And that's the question that my team and I have been spending a lot more time on the last one to two weeks. 
And what we keep talking about is this growing sense that data is the new currency in supply chain. But it's a different kind of data than where suppliers before were focused on proving evidence that their products were obviously safe, clinically effective, and provided value. The data to show clinical safety and effectiveness isn't going away. It's just no longer going to be enough. Now, suppliers are going to be asked for data to prove that they actually have enough supply on hand and that their suppliers have enough supply on hand so that the risk to a hospital or health system can be mitigated in the event of a surge or a spike in demand. And I'm assuming that focusing on data is something that's going to require almost every stakeholder that's involved in supply chain. So I wonder if we can actually go through those one by one. Let's start with device makers and manufacturers. What should they be doing in the future when it comes to shoring up enough supplies? The answer that we've been giving to the manufacturers that we work with is that they need to spend a little bit more time figuring out how much data and what kinds of data about their own supply chain and manufacturing they are willing to share with customers and with distributors. We are also telling a lot of the manufacturers that they need to think hard about where their manufacturing happens and where they might have some flexibility should they find that more and more providers demand that a portion of their manufacturing be done in the United States or at least closer to home. Hmm. Got it. And and how does your answer change if we think about the future of supply chain for distributors and technology companies? For me, I really think that distributors and technology companies have an opportunity. And it's to not just be the exchange platform or the middleman, but to actually be the trusted source of transparent data. They really have an opportunity to aggregate data and to be that source of truth when it comes to who has what and where it is produced across the supply chain to help providers not only buy what they need, but also to help health systems and potentially even state governments or larger regional purchasing coalitions allocate supplies to get that to the organizations that need it most. And then there's sort of the big one. What does the future look like for providers, particularly maybe the chief procurement officer at health systems? How might their role need to change? I think first and foremost, it's time to get them out of the basement. Hmm. I think that the period for thinking about them as operational And as folks that helped move product around and negotiated price and were rewarded simply based on budget, those days are over. They must be a strategic advisor to the CEO, the CFO, and the head of strategy. You cannot grow. You cannot make the financial and strategic decisions that you need to make as a provider organization in today's environment unless you have effectively partnered with your supply chain leaders. And, you know, this reminds me of the conversation that I think every leader in healthcare is having right now. Everyone is asking what could or perhaps should be different about their part of the industry post-COVID or peri-COVID or whatever you want to call it. And it sounds like this might be the big change for supply chain. I sure hope so. Very often, I feel like supply chain is one of those functions that is everybody's problem, but nobody's problem. Yes, there's always a head of supply chain, a head of materials management. But the truth is, is that supply chain touches every nurse, every doctor, every patient. You need those supplies where you need them, when you need them in order to provide great patient care. And I think we need to start understanding that supply chain is a vital part of care delivery. Hmm. And if supply chain is going to get a lot more strategic, I'm curious, what advice would you give to supply chain leaders at health systems, so chief procurement officers, with how they handle supply chain right now versus maybe, say, six months from now? Two pieces of advice. First, I would be bold. And I would think about the data that you need to do your job better 
And I know that we have very limited capital and limited cash in our organizations, but now is the time to at least start to familiarize your executive team with the data and the data sources that you need to do your job better. Second, I think they need to find more allies. I think that supply chain needs to work more effectively with not just finance, but medical leaders, service line leaders, and nursing leaders so that they can start to build understanding and empathy with each other to figure out how to solve those supply chain problems more collaboratively. So Brandy, I'm asking every one of my guests to answer a common question at the end of our episodes, which is, what advice would you give to leaders in healthcare right now? But of course, we're talking about leaders that span different parts of the healthcare industry. So I'm gonna ask you to answer this two ways. First, what advice would you give to executives at hospitals and health systems? And second, what advice would you give to executives in supply? So for executives at hospital and health systems, I would actually direct my answer not to the supply chain leader, but to the health system CEO and CFO. And my advice is go talk to your supply chain leader, walk down the hall, really get to know them and ask them what strategic advice they have for how you can get what you need to take care of the patients you need to and to reopen successfully while still managing for the surge. My guess is they have a lot more creative ideas than you probably realize. Hmm. And what about for executives in supply chain? My advice to them is really to lead with empathy and to now is not the time to be talking about their product or figuring out how soon surgeries can be open. And it's really to work across the hospital and health system and to bring stakeholders together to work with the physicians that they typically have really good relationships with, as well as the service line leaders and the supply chain leaders to truly understand what do they need. And now is the time for manufacturers to step up and help be really creative to figure out how to partner in all the ways that they always talk about. Well, Brandy, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's been really fun. The COVID-19 pandemic has put a spotlight on supply chain. And as a result, it's revealed a number of pain points. So in response, we're seeing a lot more innovation. There are more tools available, there's more visibility, And now we're seeing supply chain partner and collaborate in ways that are more creative, more resilient, and more transparent than ever before. This type of collaboration is essential for providing enough supplies to treat COVID-19 patients. But only time will tell if these new kinds of exchanges are temporary or long-term. I actually wanna hear what you think. Is this a Band-Aid approach or a transformational change? email us at podcasts at advisory.com. That's podcasts with an S. And remember, we're here to help. It's all this like Ohio nostalgia stuff. I'm, I'm very proud to admit that as a Virginia resident, I just got my new license plates and they say, Oh, Ohio, Ohio forever. <laughs>